Hey guys, Lord Naren White here, the Holy Ghost, the one true God. Back with you with the next video in my series, reading Dracula by Bram Stoker. Without further ado, returning to Dracula as read by Lord Naren White. And yet, if it be true, what terrible things there are in the world, and what an awful thing if that man, that monster, be really in London. I fear to think I have this moment, whilst writing, had a wire from Jonathan, saying that he leaves by the 625 tonight from Launston, and will be here at 1018, so that I shall have no fear tonight. Will you, therefore, instead of lunching with us, please come to breakfast at 8 o'clock? If this be not too early for you, you can get away if you are in a hurry by the 1030 train, and will bring you to Pathington by 235. Do not answer this as I shall take it that, if I do not hear, you will come to breakfast. Believe me, your faithful and grateful friend, Mina Harker. Jonathan Harker's Journal 26 September I thought never to write in this diary again, but the time has come. When I got home last night, Mina had supper ready, and when we had supped, she told me of Van Helsing's visit and of her having given him the two diaries copied out, and of how anxious she has been about me. She showed me in the doctor's letter that all I wrote down was true. It seems to have made a new man of me. It was the doubt as to the reality of the whole thing that knocked me over. I felt impotent, and in the dark, even of the count, uh, me, in, and in the dark, and distrustful. But now that I know, I am not afraid, even of the Count. He has succeeded, after all, then in his design in getting to London, and it was he that I saw. He has got younger, and how? Van Helsing is the man to unmask him and hunt him out. If he is anything like what Mina says, we sat late and talked it over. Mina is dressing and I shall call at the hotel in a few minutes and bring him over. He was, I think, surprised to see me. When I came into the room where he was and introduced myself, he took me by the shoulder and turned my face round to the light and said, after a sharp scrutiny, But Madame Mina told me you were ill, that you had had a shock. It was so funny to hear my wife called Madame Mina by this kindly, strong-faced old man. I smiled and said, I was ill. I have had a shock, but you have cured me already. And how? By your letter to Mina last night. I was in doubt, and then everything took a hue of unreality, and I did not know what to trust, even the evidence of my own senses. Not knowing what to trust, I did not know what to do, and so only had to keep on working in what had hitherto been the groove of my life. The groove ceased to avail me, and I mistrusted myself. Doctor, you don't know what it is to doubt everything, even yourself. No, you don't. You couldn't with eyebrows like yours. He seemed pleased and laughed as he said. So? You are a physiognomist. I learn more here with each hour. I am with so much pleasure coming to you to breakfast, and, oh, sir, you will pardon praise from an old man. But you are blessed in your wife. I would listen to him, go on praising Mina for a day, so I simply nodded and stood silent. She is one of God's women, fashioned by his own hand, to show us men and other women that there is heaven where we can enter, and that its light can be here on earth. So true, so sweet, so noble, so little an egoist, and that, let me tell you, is much in this age. So skeptical and selfish. And you, sir, I have read all the letters to poor Miss Lucy, and some of them speak of you. So I know you since some days from, knowing, from the knowing of others. But I have seen your true self since last night. You will give me your hand, will you not? And let us be friends for all our lives. We shook hands, and he was so earnest and so kind that it made me quite choky. And now, he said, may I ask you for some more help? I have a great task to do, and at the beginning it is to know. 
You can help me here. Can you tell me what went before your going to Transylvania? Later on, I may ask more help, and of a different kind, but at first this will do. Look here, uh, sir, I said. Does what you have to do concern the count? It does, he said solemnly. Then I am with you heart and soul. As you go by the 1030 train, you will not have time to read them, but I shall get the bundle of papers. You can take them with you, hand with you, and read them in the train. After breakfast, I, s I saw him to the station. When we were parting, he said, Perhaps you will come to town if I send for you, and take Madame Mina too. We shall both come when you will, I said. I had got him from morning papers and the London papers of the previous night, and while we were talking at the carriage window waiting for the train to start, he was turning them over. His eyes suddenly seemed to catch something in one of them. The Westminster Gazette. I knew it by the color, and he grew wi quite white. He read something intently, groaning to himself, Mein Gott, mein Gott, so soon, so soon. I do not think he remembered me at the moment. Just then the whistle blew and the train moved off. This recalled him to himself and he leaned out of the window and waved his hand, calling out, Love to Madame Mina, and I shall write so soon as ever I can. Dr. Seward's Diary 26 September Truly, there is no such thing as finality. Not a week since I said, Finis! And yet, here I am, starting fresh again, or rather, going on with the record. Until this afternoon, I had cause, no cause to think of what is done. Renfield had become, to all intents, as sane as he ever was. He was already well ahead with his fly business, and he had just started in the spider line also, so he had not been of any trouble to me. I had a letter from Arthur, written on Sunday, and from it I gather that he is bearing up and wonderfully well. Quincy Morris is with him, and that is much of a help, for he himself is a bubbling well of good spirits. Quincy wrote me a line too, and from him I hear that Arthur is beginning to recover something of his old buoyancy, so as to them all my mind is at rest. As for myself, I was settling down to my work with the enthusiasm, which I used to have for it so that I might fairly have said that the wound which poor Lucy left on me was becoming cicatrized. Everything is, however, now reopened, and what is to be the end, God only knows. I have an idea that Van Helsing thinks he knows, too, but he will only let out enough at a time to wet curiosity. He went to Exeter yesterday and stayed there all night. Today he came back and almost bounded into the room at about half past five o'clock and thrust last, last night's Westminster Gazette into my hand. What do you think of that? He asked as he stood back and folded his arms. I looked over the paper, for I really did not know what he meant. But he took it from me and pointed out a paragraph about children being decoyed away at Hampstead. It did not convey much to me until I reached a passage where it described small puncture wounds on their throats. An idea struck me and I looked up. Well, he said, it is like poor Lucy's. And what do you make of it? Simply that there is some in common. Whatever it was that injured the, uh, her, he injured them, has injured them, has injured them. I did not quite understand his answer. That is true indirectly, but not directly. How do you mean, Professor? I asked. I was a little inclined to take his seriousness lightly, for, after all, four days of rest and freedom from burning, harrowing, anxiety, does not, does, excuse me, does help to restore one's spirits. But when I saw his face, it sobered me. Never, even in the midst of our despair about poor Lucy, had he looked more stern. We'll go ahead and stop there for this week. As usual, I want to say thank you for watching, and I hope you enjoy. Please like, comment, and subscribe, as it greatly helps the channel. Light be with you all. Take care, and thanks again.